Good morning. Welcome back to the Caffeinated Bible. We've been looking at how to read Revelation for the past two weeks. Well, I took a week off in the middle to make papyrus with my grandkids. I know that was an interruption, but it was well worth it. And if you haven't seen that video, be sure to go back and look at the video on Can We Make Papyrus? And leave a positive comment underneath for my grandkids if you can. I know that would really encourage them. So here's this week's question for you. How do you read the book of Revelation? This is one of those questions that demonstrates just how your view of a book like Revelation has been shaped by the tradition that you've been part of. What I want to do today is look at four different ways the church has interpreted the book of Revelation. I'm going to start at the earliest methods used and move forward to where we're at today. So without too much fanfare, let's grab a cup of coffee and jump into the four ways Revelation has been historically interpreted. There have been a wide range of ways to interpret the book of Revelation, but I think we can broadly group them under four different categories. Oftentimes, an interpreter will employ a combination of two or more of these different approaches. So don't take the view that these are four rigid, hard and fast categories that don't overlap. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and for the past 20 or so years, I've been teaching in seminary and graduate schools in the area of biblical interpretation and New Testament studies. The goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and make it available to anyone, anywhere on the internet. So if you find these videos useful, please take a moment to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and leave a comment or two down below. Approach number one, the idealist or the allegorical approach. This is perhaps the earliest method that was used for interpreting Revelation, mainly because the early church was saturated with the allegorical method. So it was only natural that they read it in this manner. However, a number of the early church leaders read Revelation as a resistance document against the Roman Empire. The beast and those forces aligned with the beast represented the Roman Empire and those in authority. This reading was dangerous to the early church and many church leaders recognized that. As a result, it took the book of Revelation a long time to be accepted into the canon because the church leaders didn't want to bring the wrath of the Roman Empire down upon the church. After Constantine made the church a legal and official religion in 313 AD, they had a different problem. Now the church was officially recognized within the empire and even supported. So how should they read Revelation now? Because the beast is no longer against us. It wasn't until Augustine that this question was fully resolved around 400 to 450 AD. Augustine took a fully allegorical or idealistic approach to Revelation. When someone reads Revelation, they need to look for a deeper meaning behind the images and visions that John recorded. The basic assumption to this view is that Revelation is about the struggle between good and evil. Because this struggle has been taking place since Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden and will only end when God brings history to an end, the images and references in the book don't really refer to any historical realities. Rather, the imagery of the book of Revelation is purely symbolic according to this view. The allegorical or idealistic approach to interpreting the book of Revelation has had great staying power. It's continued for almost 2,000 years. A great example of this, if we come down to our age, is Karl Barth. He lived from 1886 to 1968, and he thought Revelation was about the eternal truths of hope and the church's struggle against evil. The strength of the allegorical or the idealist approach is that it helps us to see that the battle between good and evil is something that concerns us here and now. The weakness of this view is that it interprets the book entirely symbolically and it removes any historical references that John may have intended. Once we remove this historical background information, it gets very difficult to determine if we're actually interpreting this book correctly or not. The historicist approach believes that books like Revelation and Daniel lay out the course of history from the time of Christ to the end of the world. Now there's sort of three distinctive aspects to the historicist approach. 
The first is a fascination with attempting to give dates for when Christ will return. Writing in 1754, Charles Wesley argued that the world was going to end in 1794. Now this is interesting because his brother John thought it was impossible to discern what time or dates Revelation might be indicating. Charles, on the other hand, believed that God had revealed divine wisdom to the world, and him in particular, in order to make this rash prediction. Luckily for us, he was very mistaken. A second feature of the historicist approach is to make connections between the symbols and images in the book of Revelation with historical figures or events. Now this approach interprets the book of Revelation in terms of various historical periods from the resurrection of Jesus up until the end of time. For example, when interpreting the seven letters to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, the key thing is not so much that these were actual churches that John was writing to, Rather, these seven churches refer to seven periods in church history. For example, the letter to the church of Ephesus in chapter 2, 1 through 7, refers to the early church up until around 800 AD when they lost their first love. And then the letter to the church at Smyrna in 2, 8 through 11 refers to the church during the medieval period. And it keeps going like this. About 100 years after Charles Wesley wrote, Adam Clark wrote a commentary on almost the entire Bible. And in regard to Revelation, he says that the end is not very distant. It has already been grievously shaken by the French. In 1798, the French Republican army under General Berthet took possession of the city Rome and entirely superseded the whole papal power. This was a deadly wound, though at present it appears to be healed, but it is but skinned over and a dreadful citrus remains. If the papal power as a horn or temporal power be intended here, which is most likely, and we know that that power was given in 755 to Pope Stephen II by Pepin, King of France. Counting 1,260 years from that, we are brought to AD 25, about 190 years from the present. Now you see what Clark has done when he interprets the book of Revelation. From his point of view in 1825, he sees the French occupation of Rome as the fulfillment of Revelation 13.3. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. Then he links Pope Stephen II in 755 to other symbols, and he adds 1260 years and arrives at 2015 as the date for Christ's return. Hmm. I think CNN seems to have missed that. This approach tends to read history backwards. They start with the present age and then look back in history to see the confirmation of what Revelation is talking about in past ages, with just a little bit of what the book talks about yet to happen. The surprising thing is that almost all the Protestant reformers held this view. Martin Luther, John Calvin, even Thomas Cramner in England. And they mixed in with this historicist reading a very prejudicial anti-Catholic position as well. So the Catholic Church, especially the Pope, becomes the Antichrist in almost all of their readings. By contrast, the Catholic Church did not adopt a historicist approach during the time of the Reformation. The third interesting feature of this view is their predilection for creating complicated charts and graphs explaining the history of the world. Because see, they're looking back and so the bowls and the trumpets and the seals that are open, the seven churches, all these have to refer to different historical events, nations, or people. And so they create these graphs that show when the different events in Revelation occurred with only a small sliver of the book left yet to come. The strengths of this view are... Actually, I really can't think of any. There might be some out there, but none come to mind. The weakness of this view is that it interprets the book of Revelation from the wrong historical direction. We look back on history and try to fit the different churches, bowls, trumpets, and battles that take place in the Revelation to what we know about history, and we leave a few images and ideas for the future, such as Armageddon and the return of Christ. This approach arrives at interpretations that none of John's original readers would have understood. 
And if they would have never understood it or been able to even contemplate what this might be speaking about from a historicist's point of view, then this book would have never made it into the canon. It made it into the canon because the church found it powerful and provocative and meaningful to them in their day. They understood its message. That's why it's in the canon. This brings us to view number three, the futurist view. Now this view interprets the book of Revelation primarily as a prophecy. Revelation is a book about future events. If the early church read Revelation primarily allegorically for the first thousand years, the futurist view takes another slant on reading the symbols within the prophetic books of the Bible. The signs and images within Revelation are not to be read symbolically about the struggle between good and evil. Now they make allegorical connections between those symbols and what they think is happening or about to happen in their world. Interpreters of this view see John as giving a chronological key to the book of Revelation in 119. Now write what you have seen, what is, and what is about to take place. While there are numerous different ways that people interpret the book of Revelation according to this sort of futurist approach, the best known today is dispensational theology that exploded in the 19th and 20th centuries in America in particular. Most attribute the spread of this view to the Irish cleric John Nelson Darby, who lived from 1800 to 1882. Darby picked up the historicist reading and developed it into what is now known as dispensational theology. Basically, Darby saw that there were seven dispensations or ages throughout history, starting with Adam and Eve in the garden. The historicist view really started with the birth of the church or Christ's crucifixion, so they're slightly different in that regard. Now, according to Darby and most dispensationalists, we are in the age of grace. This age will end with God taking the church off the earth, what is known as the rapture. This event then will usher in the great tribulation, which will end with Christ returning to earth and setting up a 1,000 year rule on earth, the millennium kingdom, or another dispensational period. Darby's view received limited reception in England, but in the United States, it found fertile ground Around 1900, it was incorporated into the Schofield Reference Bible. Schofield's notes on Revelation taught that we should read Revelation as referring to distinct periods of spiritual history. According to Schofield, the world will fall under the influence of the Antichrist towards the end of time. After this, the church will be raptured, Christ will take all the faithful off the earth, and a seven-year period of tribulation will then take place. Finally, after those seven years, we have Christ returning to earth and setting up his millennial kingdom. When World War I broke out, many Christians in the U.S. felt that a futurist reading of Revelation was being fulfilled and that they were truly living in the final days before Christ returned. Couple that with the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, and it really seemed like they were living in apocalyptic times. Now, it's hard to overstate the impact of Schofield's Bible on the conservative church in the United States. Alongside the Schofield Bible, you also have Lewis Berry Schaefer, who was heavily influenced by Darby's views as well. The seminary he founded, Dow Theological Seminary, is well known for its dispensational views. Coming down a little bit closer to today, Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, was widely read and helped make this book so popular today, especially in the United States. Lindsay thought that the founding of modern Israel in 1948 was a fulfillment of prophecy. This meant that the unfulfilled prophecies in Revelation were about to take place. Famines and wars were all indications that the symbols and signs in Revelation were taking place during the 1980s. The European Union represented a revived Roman Empire that would soon be led by the Antichrist. This was then picked up and fictionalized in the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. What are the strengths of this approach? The futurist approach often ties Revelation in well with its Old Testament background, books like Ezekiel and Daniel. This approach does recognize that Revelation has a future dimension to it. It talks about the consummation of the kingdom of God and our entry into the kingdom of heaven. So it has a very strong future focus to it. The weakness of this view is that those who use this approach give too much weight 
to the prophetic dimension of the symbols and images in the book of Revelation, and they ignore the apocalyptic nature of the book. And like the allegorical and the historicist approach, this view also is based on a code that you have to find behind the images and symbols in Revelation. Oftentimes this code can only be understood by people of that generation and would never have been understood by people in John's church. For example, many dispensationalists today read the book of Revelation and its images as referring to Russia, the European Union, computer technology or nuclear weapons, references that John's readers would have found incomprehensible. And finally, all too often this approach expresses a very American perspective on the world. During the 1990s and the early 2000s, I used to teach behind the Iron Curtain. And almost every time I taught there, someone in the class would come up and ask me, how come you Americans always see our country as the Antichrist? And then I have to give a very quick apology and say, I'm sorry, but that's not the view I take. Finally, we come to what is called the Preterist view. The name for this approach comes from the Latin word Praetor, which means past. The basic assumption behind this approach is that John wrote the book of Revelation to actual churches that were facing persecution during his day. When he writes about the beast that comes up out of the water and wages war in John 13, 1 through 4, John was describing the political and military powers of his day, namely the Roman Empire. As a result, we should read the book of Revelation as a book written by John to the seven churches teaching them how to live during very tough times within the Roman Empire. The purpose of the book is to encourage them to trust God and to strengthen them during persecution. This approach is not new either. During the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic scholar Luis de Alcazar took a preterist view on Revelation. On the Protestant side, Hugo Grotius read Revelation in this manner as well. Now this is the dominant view that is held by most New Testament scholars today. A preterist reading would read the seven letters to the seven churches as actually addressing those seven historical churches during John's day, not historical periods or movements or some reference to something going on in today's world. Revelation was an apocalyptic text that was addressed to John's churches and the prophetic elements in the book were fulfilled in the first century. For example, the tribulation that the futurist or dispensational view hold that has yet to occur, the preterist view feels that this took place when Rome sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD. Another example is something that John's readers would have immediately recognized, and that is the mark of the beast in Revelation 13 verses 16 and 17. Also, it causes awe, both small and great, both rich and poor, both slave and free, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. Most scholars who take a preterist view see that this reference to the mark of the beast in chapter 13 is a reference to the image of Caesar's head that was stamped on all Roman coins, without which no one could buy or sell something. The strength of the Preterist approach is that it allows for accurate historical interpretation by putting the book of Revelation within its historical context. The weakness to this view is that when Revelation is read from a very rigid sort of Preterist view, all of the prophetic or future aspects of the book of Revelation are overlooked or diminished. So what's the best approach to take? In my opinion, perhaps the best option is to adopt a blend of preterist, idealist, and futurist approaches. The preterist approach keeps us grounded in the original historical context in which John wrote to the seven churches. We look at this book as a message that he wrote to them while they were undergoing very, very tough times. The idealist approach allows us to see that this book really is about the struggle between good and evil, heaven and earth and a global spiritual conflict from a heavenly perspective. And finally, the futurist approach reminds us that the Book of Revelation also has something to say about the future or the end of the world. The very nature of the symbols and images and the apocalyptic vision within this book means that no one historical horizon will ever exhaust the possible meanings for this book, 
Rather, it is a text which constantly generates new meanings and insights as our historical horizons change. For example, when John talks about the woman that is clothed with the sun, what the heck is that talking about? It's one of these images that really seems to refer to either the church, Israel, Mary, or some other idea that John and his churches would have understood. But it's a very provocative and powerful image that has generated a great deal of artwork through the ages. What's the point to this little historical exercise with Revelation? The first is that ideas have consequences. That views that were put forward by John Darby are still having a powerful impact on our churches today. Two, that the symbols and images in Revelation are not exhausted by previous interpretations, but they allow readers to recognize all sorts of different possibilities in light of their situation. Therefore, we must be very careful about what we claim the author is referring to in various passages within this book. And finally, no matter what approach you take, I think there's a simple test to see if your interpretation might be valid. All you have to do is ask, would someone in John's church agree with or understand my interpretation of this passage? For example, if you think the mark of the beast is a computer chip, do you think John's readers would have had even the slightest idea at all of what you're talking about? If not, then you might want to reconsider that view. We're going to pick up with Revelation again next week, and we're going to look at the seven letters to the seven churches and kind of dive a little deeper just into that passage. Remember, if you like these videos, please subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and let your friends know by hitting that share button. Until then, I will leave you with the word of peace. Oh, oh, and don't forget to take a look at the video on making papyrus with my grandkids. The link to it, I think, is right over here. So if you click on that image, you should be taken straight to that video. It was a really fun exercise, and I hope you liked the video.